At least after the first 1000 bomber night raid by the RRF, Germany was forced to come up with a viable solution to counter the Allied bomber formations targeting the inner cities at night. Over the next year, various ideas and solutions were proposed. During this time, Major Hayo Hermann came up with an idea of his own. In his mind, a dedicated Jagdgeschwader flying single-engine fighters hunting enemy aircraft at night had the best chances of succeeding where previous efforts had failed. The whole concept was met with skepticism. The mere thought of sending fighters up in the night without any kind of sophisticated night navigational equipment that could only be fitted into large aircraft at the time seemed ludicrous. No one wanted to weigh in their authority and gamble on success when the chances seemed so minuscule. The Luftwaffe had barely any planes to spare as it was. This might have been the end to a Hermann's idea, lost somewhere in the plethora of vested interests and bureaucrats. Ironically, Sir Arthur Harris came to the rescue by ordering another bomber raid on the city of Cologne in July 1943. Bio Hermann sent out his fighters to engage the British bombers. By the end of the night, 12 British bombers were shot down. Now for many of us, 12 shot down planes out of more than 650 doesn't seem like much. Considering that the Germans saw it as an astounding success, shows how little success they had in countering the night bombing raids until now. Only 10 days later, Hermann was ordered to set up a Geschwader of night fighters, codename Wilde Sau. After the RF also started using window and temporarily knocked out German radar a few weeks later, Germany was out of options. Suddenly, Wilde Sau seemed like the only effective countermeasure and support from all sides of the Luftwaffe was simply flying Hermann's way. Eventually, three Geschwaders would be set up, JG-300, 301, and 302. Now before we delve into the tactics of Wildesau, let us have a quick look at the organization. Initially, the Versuchskommando had nine pilots. Looking at the screen now, you'll notice one glaring consistency. Not one of these pilots has a Jagdgeschwader background. Instead, they were bomber pilots, Stuka pilots, night fighter pilots, or instructors. This was because the Luftwaffe had not trained fighter pilots in blind flying. After all, it wasn't really necessary. So while nearly no experienced fighter pilot had the necessary Blindflugschein 1, 2 or 3, pilots from other branches of the Luftwaffe did. In the interest of speeding up training, these pilots were preferred. That of course means that the pilots unused to fast single-engine fighters had to be completely retrained, and this did cause some casualties along the way. As well as that, before the Wildesau Geschwaders had machines of their own, they were forced to share Bf 109s and Focke-Wolf 190s with existing squadrons. These were called Aufsitzergruppen. While it was a solution to the problem, this created all sorts of issues, from increased wear and tear of the machines to the typical German problem of logistics and responsibility. The question always arose that with two separate Jagdgeschwaders operating the same machine, who was responsible for its maintenance and supply? For example, in October 1943, JG-301 was using machines of JG-1 and JG-11, while JG-302 was also using these machines in November 1943 when it was set up. During the transition from 1943 to 44, both squadrons had access to the following machines. For JG-301, the Stab had one B of 109G6 and one Focke Wolf 190A7. Erste Gruppe of JG-301 had no planes on their roster, zweite Gruppe had 3 Bf 109 G6, dritte Gruppe had 22 Bf 109 G6 and zehnte Gruppe had 10 Bf 109 G6. Für JG-302, der Stab had 2 Bf 109 G6, erste Gruppe had 4 Bf 109 G5 and 27 Bf 109 G6, zweite Gruppe had 1 Focke Wolf 190A5 and 1 Focke Wolf 190A6 and dritte Gruppe had no planes on their roster. You'll notice that while in popular memory Wildesau was operating Focke Wolf 190s, the overwhelming majority of the aircraft at this point were Bf 109s. Later on, the amount of Focke Wolf 190s in the squadron would increase, and by the end of the war, some Wildesau pilots would even fly the TAR 152. Now let us look at the tactics of Wildesau. Wildesau was a genuine defensive strategy. Whereas previous attempts at to engage night bombers tried to take on the bombers before they reached their targets, Wildesau pilots waited for their prey around their intended target. When being called to action, pilots were in constant contact with the radio controllers and would be sent to the most likely target based on the flight path of the bombers, and they did not operate in the Rotte, Schwarm and Staffel system. Once they arrived, they would circle at high altitudes and wait. Since night bombers would often come at intervals in less dense formations and at various altitudes, 
This allowed pilots the highest chances of spotting them in time. Once the bombers approached, the flak would fire illumination rounds and searchlights illuminated the sky. Of course, the flak would also fire their standard shells, but we will get into that a little bit later. By patrolling around the target, the chance of hitting a bomber before it drops its payload were relatively small. That being said, there was little else that could be done, since the single-engine fighters did not have the necessary equipment to hunt bombers anywhere else. Interestingly, Wilder's Thou pilots often wished for a cloudy night, since this would help them spot their target. To make sense of this, we must look for the eyes of the pilot. Imagine flying high above cloud cover, knowing that some enemy bombers will fly between you and the clouds. Now, innumerable searchlights aim for the sky and shine a light on these clouds. Suddenly, the distinct shapes of the bombers stick out like chocolate splatters on a white shirt, only waiting to be picked off. The fact that cities also started to burn and radiate light themselves further assisted the Wildesau pilots. Of course, Wildesau was also conducted in cooperation with the flak. The general idea was that flak would only fire into certain zones or at certain altitudes and not higher. This varied from day to day and also from flak commander to flak commander. While some commandants were sympathetic to the Wildesau pilots, others preferred blasting away as long as they had some sense of where the enemy was likely to be. On the flip side, some Wildesau pilots also took things to the next level by purposely ignoring the zones that were reserved for the flak and trying their luck there. This has led to some comments that flak was responsible for the death of more than a few pilots, but we will go into that in just a second. Although Wildesau had some merit, it had two basic flaws. The chances of success were often more dependent on the weather and visibility conditions of the night than the actual skill of the pilot. During nights where visibility was poor, pilots would often return without a single kill. The other flaw was that the machines used for Wildesau were not really suited towards the need of the night fighter. While some attempts were made to assist the pilots in their navigation, and the constant guidance of the German radar also helped, the pilot's skill and mental fortitude were tested to the absolute limit. Indeed, there are instances of pilots failing to return, with no one knowing for certain what happened to them even after their wrecks were found. Between the 3rd of September and the 30th of December, JG301 and JG302 managed to claim 47 confirmed kills at night. Against this stand the casualties. JG301 suffered 11 wounded pilots and 25 deaths. JG302 suffered 4 wounded and 14 deaths. This amounts to a total of 54 casualties to 47 victories. Note that 20 pilots died due to accidents like navigational errors or fatal takeoffs and landings. That accounts for roughly 37% of the total losses during this time. As a bit of trivia, two casualties were to German flak and both were only wounded. In total and during the whole war, only four German Wildesau pilots became casualties to friendly fire from flak, of which two ended fatally. Of course, the Germans did try to help their pilots' navigation the best they can, placing long lines of light beacons to guide them back to the airfields. But considering that the planes were not equipped to handle these situations, and that most pilots were still relatively new to fighter aircraft, accidents happened and mistakes were made. The Luftwaffe quickly realized that Wilde Zau was only a stopgap measure at best, and not an answer to the constant stream of RAF bombers that were hounding German cities. As such, efforts were redoubled to find alternatives to this rather risky tactic, which were eventually found. The beginning of the end of Wilde Zau thus came relatively quickly. Already on the 5th of January 1944, the first daytime operations were conducted by the Ernst Weil Night Fighter Squadrons. As mentioned previously, Many of the pilots had clocked up hundreds of hours of flight time, but had no background in dogfighting. Thus, the initial encounters with escort fighters resulted in the loss of many experienced pilots. By the time JG-302 was disbanded, their official score was the following. 231 enemy planes shot down, 209 of which 4 engine bombers, 21 escort fighters and 1 mosquito. These were the result of 50 combat sorties. In the same time, an estimated 133 pilots had been part of JG-302. 67 of these died and 40 were injured. That means that 107 out of 133 pilots became casualties between November 1943 and August 1944. JG-301, on the other hand, fought from September 1943 until the German capitulation in May 1945. After a reorganization in mid-1944, it experienced an influx of a lot of inexperienced pilots. It flew 70 combat missions and sustained 408 casualties, 258 deaths, 
141 wounded and 9 MIAs. It also lost 125 technicians and ground staff during a hasty retreat of the second Gruppe from Romania in 1944. It shot down 156 bombers and 38 fighters. As always, a huge thank you for tuning in and I hope that you enjoyed and learned something from today's video. I'd like to once again thank all my existing Patreons for their support that allows me to make these videos. If you want to support my work as well, consider checking out my Patreon. You can find all my sources in the description. If you are interested in knowing how the German Bf 110 reloaded its guns in mid-flight, yes, that was actually a thing, click on this video. And if you want to know more about how the Luftwaffe failed in World War II, click on this video by Military History Visualized. As always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.